And welcome back to the 3 p.m. Uh, Winter Fire School Facebook Live uh, keynote addresses. This time we have Ron Canterman with us. And Ron is more than a four decade veteran of the fire service. He has recently retired. Uh, he has a BA degree in fire administration and two master's degree. He contributes uh, an author to fire engineering, fire engineering handbook for firefighter one and two, the seventh edition of fire chiefs handbook. Hopefully Ron is out there. Ron, thank you for uh, being part of the uh, uh, virtual seminar today with us live on Facebook. Uh, we're looking forward to your class uh, tomorrow, fight the fire, not the building also. And you still have time out there, uh, people in Facebook land to register for uh, Ron's class. Uh, just go to our website, mufrti.org and uh, you can register, click on the Winter Fire School virtual conference and get registered to uh, see the class. So we're going to turn it over now to Ron Canterman. Thank you, Tracy. Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear, sir. Okay, I'm gonna we're gonna do some share screen right now, so everybody can see my uh, my slides wherever they might be. Let me see. Uh, we'll get them. Hang on. We're doing good, sir. We're doing good. Stay with me. Okay. Can, can you see if you can you see my screen? Is it does it look like a New York license plate? You see my screen on my computer? No, not yet. All right, hang on. Okay, we're going to get there. Uh, well, while I'm trying to get the PowerPoint and share the screen, uh, I just uh, a, a comment on on that phenomenal video. There's nothing like 15 minutes of fire porn to get everybody <laughs> going on a Missouri conference. You know, you got to love that. Yes. So let me, we uh, we know our audience. Yeah, you guys, you do. Okay, let me uh, get this back up. No? Yeah, we're working on it. This is the technology, man. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Okay, now we're going to try share screen again. And we're going to do that and that. And I share. Okay, what do you see now, Trace? We are good, sir. We have you. Okay, slideshow. You see my slides? Yeah. Okay, yes, you, got yes, that yes, guy look, you got the guy looking in the mirror there? Yep. All right, cool. All right, so uh, I, I want to thank the uh, the Missouri Institute for bringing me back. Uh, I've been there live twice in Missouri or Missouri, depending on what side of the state you come from. Uh, you guys are the show me state, I'm pretty sure. And uh, I've been out there a couple of times and I, and I had uh, you, you folks are the perfect host, I will tell you, say. Uh, uh, I'm broadcasting live from New York. Uh, I, I live in the county just north of the five boroughs of the city. Uh, we had two feet of global warming fall on us on Monday and Tuesday, and we're expecting another foot of global warming to fall on us on uh, on a Sunday into Monday. So uh, we're in the dead of winter here in the Northeast, and uh, we're dealing with it like we usually do. We knew it was coming. The squirrels got real fat. They were bulking up. So uh, there, there we go. So uh, it, today's keynote is, is about taking a good look at ourselves and, and an introspective looking in the mirror and from a leadership perspective, you know, and, and we'll talk about that mirror and about what we think we see. All right. So I, 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 re, I refer to uh, Michael Jackson, singer, songwriter, the king of pop, they call them. And uh, whether you're a fan or not, uh, he was a, a, a talented songwriter, lyricist, and, and entertainer. A lot of people paid a lot of money to see Michael on stage in his day. But here's what he says in this song, uh, The Man in the Mirror. I'm going to make a change for once in my life. It's going to feel good. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make it right. So when, when, you, when you listen or, or, or read those words, it's about making change for the good and, and being a person that you want to be. So I think Michael was onto something there. So with that, just a, a hair about me, uh, Tracy said I got four, four decades in the fire service. Uh, in my, uh, I left my last command about 18 months ago, and I'm currently working in fire and life safety in a, in a, uh, a medical center in Manhattan. Uh, it's 14 high-rise interconnected buildings. It's a busy place. So uh, while I retired from the fire service, I'm still involved in fire protection, life safety, and uh, it's my life's work, so I'm still in it. So I, I did go to my fire, my first fire a long time ago, 
I, I, I didn't quite get to pump that that particular piece, but uh, I went to my first fire a very long time ago in the early 70s. So I've been around for longer than 20 minutes, and it's okay to be old school. It's okay to have that 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 uh, that underlying old school drive and and that knowledge base, but you had better have an open mind. If you want to be a leader of today, you have to have an open mind. The world's changing rapidly. News comes very, very fast, faster than ever. Uh, we used to wait for a letter in the mail or possibly a phone call. Now anything that happens is, is instant and it's out there. So it's okay to be old school, but have an open mind. Okay, that's today's leader needs, needs to have that perspective. And, and progress is a state of mind. You know, uh, that's the early apparatus, you know, not as early as the hand pumper, but uh, whatever, made, whatever made it work at that moment in time for that particular fire department somewhere in the United States, well, that's okay. You know what? And, and we didn't deviate far from this. What, what you're looking at now, the old fire bike, because when we have uh, large gatherings, events, which we, we hope we're going to have soon again, when, when you have those, then we, what do we do? We, we, we don't take the apparatus. We get a golf cart or we get a gator. And we put medical bags on it and we make our way through the crowd. So this isn't uh, quite too far off from what we're doing right now. So progress is a state of mind. You know, we talk with that, that saying, if I hear this again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scream. Uh, 300 to 250 years of, prog uh, of, of uh, tradition unimpeded by progress. No, if, if the fire service was 250 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, we'd still be riding around and we'd still be pulling these with horses. OK, so that's not true. It's not true. We've made great strides in everything. Tools, turnout gear. Our fire is the same, basically, except that we know the fire loads are different today than they ever were because we're living in a hydrocarbon based society. Right? Fires are hotter, faster and more toxic than they ever were. OK, my fire is not the fire of a 25 year old firefighter who just got started. That's for sure. OK, so leadership in general is uh, physical. I'm just going to adjust this little screen to the right to, to get myself because I think I'm blocking out. I'm going to pull myself down to the bottom so I can see down. And hopefully I'm not blocking things out with the uh, with the zoom. We're zooming through Facebook, uh, the modern technology. Right. Uh, so leadership is physical, mental and social. OK. And, and I had something in a couple of years back. I, uh, I went to the doctor and he said, tell me what your problem is. And I said to him, Listen, I get up in the morning, I go in the bathroom, I look in the mirror, I, I, I throw up, I vomit, and then I take a shower and go to work. He said, say that again? I said, I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, I vomit, take a shower and go to work. So he gave me the examination, I went in his office. I said, what's wrong with my gastrointestinal system? He said, nothing, And but your eyesight's perfect, he said to me. So uh, that's the laugh of the day. If you didn't laugh at that, you're not gonna get anything else for what I said, okay? So uh, this is all physical, mental. This is hard work. Leadership is hard work. And if when you look at why systems fail, uh, the banks in Wall Street in 2008, why did those systems fail? It's a failure of leadership. Failure of leadership. And some of those folks got off great. The CEO of Merrill Lynch, they fired him because they had bought up hundreds of thousands of, of uh, mortgages, and then they came due when there were balloon payments. It's like this, it's his fault. You got to blame the top guy. It's like being in a firehouse. It, it all stops at the chief's desk. The buck stops here. So they, they, they released him with a $10 million parachute. They made sure he had a $10 million parachute. But you look at failures, look at large companies. Kodak. Kodak is a shell of its former self. You know why? They didn't keep, they didn't keep up with the changing times. Uh, IBM almost went under. IBM was real close to going under. Somebody saved them, okay? Solomon Brothers, they were a big player on Wall Street. All these are failure of leadership. When you look at, at, at basic corporations or our organizations, think about your fire department, whether it's successful or not. And successful doesn't necessarily mean uh, getting to the job, getting to the fire, putting the fire. Yeah, that's success. Making a rescue, that's success. Getting people out. But are you successful internally? Uh, are you able to, to, to deal with the bosses that while they're willing to talk to you, you know, or are you up against the glass ceiling? We'll talk about the glass ceiling. OK, so what about the guy in the fire SUV? Most of you have seen that video, that that comedian. The guy, I think the guy's hysterical. You know, he says, I want to be the guy that drives the fire SUV. You know, he's a relaxed guy. He doesn't have to drag any hose. He's like, he just directs firefighters. Hey, listen, 
If you guys see fire, put water on a fire. He does that whole routine. If you've never seen it, <clears throat> Google fire SUV and take a look at the routine. It's about five minutes long. It's pretty funny, you know, but he makes it sound easy. The guy in the SUV he just says to the other guys, put water on the fire, but it's really not because that's part of the part of being a leader. Uh, and certainly in our business is, is being a leader on the fire ground. Okay. And, and, and it starts before the fire ground. It starts, but we're going to talk about that. But leadership starts before the fire ground, because when you get out to the fire ground, when you get out to our battleground, the person in charge has to have that credibility, has to have that leadership credibility way before you get to the emergency, way before. So while it sounds pretty easy by our comedian friend, it's really not easy. It's hard work because you know what? No matter what, people are watching us every minute of every day. Five, eight, ten years ago, when, when video cameras started to be installed in streets and at stores and storefronts, and people were afraid about burglaries and robberies and all that stuff, just about the time that people were getting cameras on their telephones, uh, we realized that that we were being watched more than ever, you know. And and because of that, the, the, the law enforcement is more successful than ever because the bad guys they haven't picked up on it yet. They don't realize they're on camera back then. Somebody said, we're on camera about 25 times a day, just out and about, going shopping, stopping at the gas station, going to work. Okay, Now you're on camera 200 times a day, just being out and about. And that's the fixed cameras. Everybody else has one in their hand now. The bad guys haven't gotten that yet. They're still beating, not, knocking off liquor stores and beating up old people and getting caught. And the, the cops, their numbers went way up. But they're not any better detectives now than, than they were back then. But everybody's on camera. We're on camera too. You have to act, you have to lead, and you have to behave as if you are being filmed because the people are watching, okay? These two gentlemen, they took it to the next step. They brought chairs. There's probably a cooler in between them or a cup of coffee. So they're doing a great job of watching, but people are watching, you know? And, and part of that, that people watching thing is being on the fire ground and, and not having that horse play, you know? And, and, and you know, save that for when the doors are down and you're inside. You know, but but, you know, people are having the worst day of their lives when they call us and they call us they dial 911 to get it for us to get in between them and their problem, make the problem go away. And we're out there, you know, grabbing each other's tush or whatever we're doing out there uh, or having a good laugh. You know, we're standing in front of this house on fire. The people are outside and, and they, they see their whole lives dissolving in front of them. And somebody throws a funny line and all the guys are laughing or all the firefighters. Are laughing. It's not a good thing for us because we've got to do something called reputation management. And that's where your leadership skills come in. That's when you, in the morning, you get up and look in the mirror and say, all right, today's my day. I'm going to be a better leader today because everybody's watching. And the expectations are high. Let me get this out of the way. I don't know if, if I'm blocking that, this other picture, that guy's stuck in that screwy thing there. But uh, the expectations are high because when that bell goes off, when the dispatcher hits the tones, career volunteer or otherwise, Okay, and make no mistake, we don't draw lines between any of that, not where I come from. Okay, I've also been attached to the fallen firefighters for 24 years. And let me tell you something the, the monument in Emmitsburg doesn't say paid volunteer or anything. There's a name on that stone that that firefighter was killed in line of duty. So the fire doesn't know if you get paid or not. So, volunteer career or otherwise, when the bell goes off, when the hook goes in, whatever you call it where you live, people expect us to come and make it right. And these are some of the things. These aren't, these aren't Photoshop. They're there. Okay, so the expectations are high from the public. And we'll talk about the public trust. So who is the leader? Now, some leaders are obvious. It's what's on their collar. Five horns, four horns, two horns, a bar, two bars. Lieutenant, captain, battalion chief, district chief, deputy chief. Whatever. Yeah, and you get there either through exam, competitive exam, appointment, a vote in, in the, perhaps in a volunteer firehouse. So we know who we know who the leaders are supposed to be because of what's on their collar. Okay. But we talk about unofficial leaders. We talk about stepping up. You know, my, my good friend, uh, Dennis Compton, long 50 year career, uh, did some great writing on leadership. And uh, he was chairman of the board of the Fallen Firefighters Foundation for a while. And his thing was when in doubt lead. And he did some great seminars around the country. You know, step up. Someone has to step up. And when we talk about step up, and Frank Viscuso picked up on my good buddy from New Jersey. Uh, he wrote a book called Step Up and Lead. It's the same concept. It's about somebody's got to do something to make this right. 
whatever that is, whatever that thing is to be made right, someone's got to step up. So that that morning, you know, you get up every every morning, you look in the mirror. Hopefully, you don't throw up like I did, but you look in the mirror and you say, "Today's my day." Today's my day. Now, for, for my volunteer firefighter friends, every day is your day, no matter what, because you never know when the hook's coming in. For the career guys and gals, when you go to work, you step in that fire on the way to work. Every time you're on the way to fire us, you got to think, what am I going to do today to make it right, to make it better, okay, and 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 to survive the fire ground, and to survive the fire ground. So I, I hate I hate blocking that logo, but I'm going to slide this down a little more. Uh, that's the Congressional Medal of Honor there. You can see that. But uh, I had a chance encounter with, with two people who were the, the step up and lead, when in doubt lead. These were Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, and I, and I call them award winners, and they got highly insulted. This is not an award, sir. We are recipients of the Medal of Honor. So I'm in an airport on a layover in Detroit, heading for a conference, and this gentleman walks by, and I'm just reading a book. And I see feet walking in front of me and you kind of look up and see what's going on. And we're on a layover, the weather's bad. We're waiting for the storm to clear. And on the back of his baseball hat is that is, is uh, the name uh, Herschel Woody Williams. So I didn't think anything of it. Then he sat down and I saw the logo. So I couldn't help myself. I'm a very shy guy. You could probably tell by now in New Yorker, right? Not, nothing keeps us back. I walked over. I said, are you honoring somebody with your hat? He said, no, that's me. You know, I, I'm the guy. And I, I'm immediately, I'm numb at this point. Absolutely numb. This is about, uh, I'm going to say six years ago or so. I'm absolutely numb. I shake his hand. I say, congratulations. And I ask him, would you tell me what you did? He said, we were, we were pinned down on Iwo Jima. He said, I got a flamethrower on my back. He says, there's a machine gun nest. And they got us pinned down. And, and they are, I mean, we're, he says, we're eating dirt. We're so far down into the dirt because they are just relentless. He says, and it started to let up a little bit. And I said to my lieutenant, I'm going to, I'm going to go around the side with the flamethrower and I'm going to take care of the bunker. Lieutenant looked at him. He says, you sure? And he says, I didn't wait for an answer. And he went around. This guy stepped up and, and then the, the machine gun fires. And on the heavy fire, he got to that bunker and took the bunker out with his flamethrower, this guy. And then he says, would you like to meet another Congressional Medal of Honor recipient? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm already in awe of this guy. Of course, at this point, he's about 80 years old. He's a World War II vet. So he says, come on, here's my buddy Tom. So Tom was an Army Air Corps pilot. Army Air Corps was the, was the precursor to the Air Force. He says, this is Tom Hudner. So I sit down with Tom. I shake his hand. Also a little bit younger, but a little more feeble and, and a little more ill. He's traveling with his wife. And I said, Tom, would you please tell me why you got the, the, the medal? He said, I was flying partners. He says, you know, with single, single, single airplane, there's two of us next to each other, and we're in enemy territory, and we're doing our thing. He says, my partner gets shot down in rugged, mountainous terrain. So I circled three or four times really low to see if I could see if he's, and he's struggling to get out of the cockpit, and the plane's on fire. So the only thing I could do, I hope you're sitting down, you, you folks who are watching this on Facebook or wherever else you're watching it, sit down, I'll give you three seconds to sit. He says, the only thing I can do is crash my plane and go rescue my buddy. So he crashed a perfectly good airplane to see if he can get his buddy out, and he did. He got him out of the plane. The guy, the guy was so busted up and burned up, he died anyway. Uh, but then Tom was able to radio before he crashed to other units who came in close, took the enemy out, rescued him, and they got his buddy uh, back to the hospital, but, but for naught. So when you talk about step up and lead and you listen to these stories of these men, it was so it was so honored for me, and they thought they thought it was cool. They were talking to a fire chief, you know. Uh, I it was like, no, no, let's not talk about me. This is you guys, and then of course I tipped off the pilot when we got on the plane flying. They were going to the same place. We were heading to Omaha, Nebraska, and they were actually opening a new air and space museum, and invited those guys to come and be part of the ambiance of opening the museum. But uh, I call them American royalty, and and I wrote an article on it for Fire Engineering about meeting a, American royalty. These guys are American royalty, no doubt about it. But they stepped up. They stepped up and said, I need to do something today to make a difference. That's the key. So when we look at, at leaders, at leaders and, and certain qualities, and, and you can think about these, you know, what are the qualities of a good leader? And you think about those one words, you know, and the first thing that came to my mind when I started putting this program together many, many years ago, and of course I modify it every three or four months because I read something else or do a little more research. But I'm, I grew up in Boy Scouting, 
and the scout law, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, the whole scout law, you know, with one or two exceptions of other qualities of good leader. The, big, the first one is trustworthy. Okay, if, 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 if as a leader, you lie to your people, they'll never come back to you. They'll never trust you again. But say that that person lied to me. I can't believe another word they're going to say. So uh, you can think about the qual. Think about good leaders that you've met in the fire service. If you're a volunteer that you've met at your regular job uh, or just nationally known leaders, whether it was a, a president or it was a, a past president or uh, military people, you know, I, we go around the room when we're alive and, and I hear, you know, we talk about who are the great leaders in history, you know, and I hear it, everything from Patton to, to Grant to Lincoln to Jesus to uh, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Amelia Earhart, you know, just it's a, it's a guy and then bad, real bad guys, Hitler and, and Ben Laden, were they great leaders? Yeah, they just, society frowned on what they, what their thoughts were. But well, they were great leaders because they got all those people to believe in their vision and got them moving toward their vision. So we, we ask these questions about leadership and management. You know, are they the same? They're not the same. Can you be a good leader and a lousy manager? Yeah. Next question, yes. Can you be good or bad or both? I knew a fire chief who was a dynamite manager. This guy can manage his fire department. I mean, he can, he can order ice in the middle of February on 10 degrees and everybody would say thank you. But the firefighters wouldn't follow this guy to the bagel store. They wouldn't follow him to the local deli for a hot dog because his leadership style, well, he didn't have any leadership style, okay? My way or the highway, the guy was a tyrant, you know, and, and, and a great guy in a way of when he left, um, he packed up at five o'clock on a Friday and looked at his second in command and said, by the way, I just retired, packed up a box and walked out the door. Terrific man. <clears throat> So uh, this guy, Peter Drucker, uh, an educator and entrepreneur, says the leader sees leadership as a responsibility rather than as a rank and privilege. You better believe it. Because it's not about being in charge. A lot of people say that when you get promoted. Oh, you're in charge now. It's not about being in charge. It's about being responsible. It's about being responsible for the people under your command and the people you work with, volunteer career or otherwise, that we're going to put in a dangerous situation. And my good friend, Ronnie Coleman from California, who's been writing in magazines and lecturing forever. Ronnie says, we're the best people to go into a dangerous situation and come out alive. We are the best people to do that. So why not live up to that reputation and, and, and take leadership to that next level? Okay, but it's about being responsible. It's not about uh, responsible for the people, okay, rather than looking for that rank. And, the rank and privilege might come. But you don't do it for the rank and privilege. You do it for, there's a whole bunch of other reasons. But make sure you do it for the right reasons if you're going to get in a leadership position. So, uh, yeah, you're in charge, but it's not about being in charge. Okay? It's about being responsible. Okay, remember that. So we talk about servant leadership. Servant leadership is a concept that's been written upon. And there were seven pillars of servant leadership. Okay, the picture shows three. Okay, I don't know why I couldn't find a picture with seven pillars on it. So I apologize for that. However, the, uh, we talk about the seven pillars of servant leadership. If you were going to be in a leadership role, okay, you, you're there to do servant leadership. You're there to serve the people who you are going to lead. Okay? You have to be, first thing, a person of character. Uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, four-star general. Uh, they called him Storm and Norman. He hated that name, but the press named him Storm and Norman. Uh, he... Um, he, uh, he said, if you have to be without uh, character or strategy, be without strategy. That's coming from a four-star general. If you have to be without character or strategy, be without strategy. Character was more important. Martin Luther King said the same thing. I want my children to grow up, not based on the color of their skin, but on their character. Okay, so character is big. <clears throat> and that's your integrity and your good name. That's what you build your whole career. Okay? As a leader, you put your people first. You know, when anytime we had any kind of meal in the firehouse, I went up to that pot last as, as a chief officer, last. And of course, what are the firefighters? Chief, go ahead, start it off. Nope. Nope. I needed an engine, a truck, and two ambulances and a car. My car was the oldest car in the fleet when I went to a, my two commands ago. So the big bosses, the, the administrators, are you going to get yourself a new car? I said, no, no, my car doesn't put the fire out. We need an engine, we need a truck, we need ambulances to train. I'll go last. 
You know, like my good friend, Captain Abershaw from the Navy wrote a great book called It's Your Ship. And he talks about going on to a naval ship and eating last and then going, going into the, to the, to the enlisted men's mess to sit down at the table with them and, and get their ideas. The ship, the ship almost went down when he did that. Nobody could believe it because you're in the military, they're very structured. But he got out of the box, this guy. Put his people first. And we need to do that too in the firehouse. You got to be a skilled communicator. If you're not good at that, you got to get good at that. Practice. If you're going to give lectures, if you're going to teach, if you're going to preach, if you're going to do training, practice in front of the mirror, practice in front of your family. Okay, they'll make fun of you, but that's the way it goes. Okay, it's, it's okay. Uh, the other next pillar is be a compassionate collaborator. Okay, be that person. You know, people say, I hate to be that guy, but, you know, I don't want to be that woman, but be the collaborator. Okay, a couple of friends of mine call me the great coordinator or the great collaborator because I, I just have this knack, this weird ability to bring people together to work out a problem. And it could be inside the department or interdepartment. Let's get the cops in here. Let's get DPW. Let's, we got this, this thing going on in town and let's plan for it. You got to have a little foresight. You got to be able to look in that in that uh, that uh, crystal ball, you know, kind of look at the future. And that's really just forward planning. It's strategic planning. Uh, the next pillar is being a systems thinker. We would like to think that the fire department in our jurisdiction, we are the be all end all to all people. And people call us for everything. I get that. People call us for everything. You know, they, they if, if they call they call the police, and if the cops can't shoot at it, they don't want to know about it. If they call another agency, we had we got a phone call in, in my last command. This guy, he had a bat in the house. He called animal control, the police department, DPW. He called every town agency. He called the firehouse. What do you think happened? A guy said, next time we go out on a run, we'll come by the house, see if we can help you. And they went there. And the, the, this guy's wife and kids were locked in the bathroom screaming. And he came to the door actually with, a, with, a, with a, uh, a laundry basket on his head. I wish we had a picture of this. You can't make it up. OK, we see everything in the firehouse, right? And uh, my guys went in. He says, you play tennis? I worked in a very wealthy community, uh, bedroom community. Everybody played tennis. People had tennis courts at their house. That's how big the houses were, six, seven, 8,000 square foot homes. Oh, yeah, right over there. Picked up my guy, went in with a racket, had his turnout gear on. They put the lights on, and here comes Batman. And they, sla they slapped him, and they got him. And that was it. That's what we do. That's what we do. So you, you got to be a systems thinker, and you got to include everything and everybody all the time. And then leading with moral authority. You know, we talk about people's morals. You know, what are, what are people's, people have good morals, bad morals? You got to have good morals to be in a leadership position. So being a servant leader, you're taking care of your people first. It's, that's key. I put my people first all the time. Uh, President John Kennedy said, leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. It never stops. I'm still reading. You, you heard some of my credentials that, that Tracy talked about with, with go degrees and all that stuff and four decades in the fire service. I'm still reading. I'm still learning. <clears throat> I picked up a fire magazine in the last couple of months. I did a lot of reading during COVID when we were all home. Let me tell you, caught up on all my reading, read some great stuff, did some more leadership research. I was reading an article on an operation and I yelled out to my wife, I haven't seen this before. She says, you're being around, you and Ben Franklin were best friends. I said, yeah, other than that, I've never seen, I've never heard of this. So it never stops. So if you're in a leadership position or you're going to be in a leadership position, remember that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. And every time, every moment you have to get your hands on something, read it, learn it, and then share it. Most important, share it. You want to concentrate on developing yourself. OK, if you learn something, try to apply it rapidly, whether you're a company officer or a chief officer. Um, I was at the National Fire Academy taking the course. I ended up teaching there for about 12 years, but I taken the first couple of courses many, many years ago. I, I found something in this class that, that I, I wanted to use in my department and I, we were looking for something. And there it was. And when I got home, I went to my offices and I said, listen, I got the answer to our problem. It's right here in the book. <clears throat> And, and we tried it, we tried to implement it quickly and it was so many other things going on, but, but we, never, we never let it out of our sight. I always had that, that binder book just to my right so I could keep an eye on it to remind me to go back to it. And eventually we got back to it. So try to apply new things rapidly or because it's gonna fade. When you go to a conference or you go to a class, say, wow, what a great idea. Get back and start talking about it because it's gonna end up on your mental shelf and on the physical shelf. 
Uh, try new things. Uh, I think Chief Brunacini back in the day, he said, you know, we'll try anything. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. I mean, it's, it's, it's simple stuff. It's simple stuff. So get out and try new things. You never know. There's a new hose load. There's this. It's a couple of years ago, I think there was something called the Cincinnati hose coil uh, or the Cleveland coil. And you hooked it up to a standpipe outlet, opened up the water, and it unfurled itself. No kinks, no nothing. It worked great on the apparatus floor. Then we took it into a stairwell and it got jammed up underneath all the railings. It didn't work for us. You try to think, all right, let's try something else. It's okay. Part of self-development and being a leader is to seek opportunities to contribute. You're expected to contribute. I had an opportunity to join a civic group where I'm living now. We moved here six years ago. And, and I met a doctor uh, who's one of my doctors. And he says, I, listen, I belong to this civic group. I won't tell you which one. He said, why don't you come to a dinner meeting and check it out? So I did. I went to two dinner meetings as his guest. And I said, you know what? I'm going to join this gang. And then I realized that I wouldn't be able to contribute the way I wanted to contribute. And I turned it down. Of course, I'm locked up with four other organizations. So you're expected to contribute, particularly in your leadership position in the fire service. But you have to have make enough time and have the wherewithal to do that contribution. Okay. Part of self-development is going to conferences. We're all here today. I'm in New York. You're in Missouri, Missouri. It's all good. Okay. And peers and mentors. I'm lucky. I met my mentor when I was 17. I was a freshman in college. I went to school in Manhattan. He was a young fire officer in, a, in an energy company. And uh, he retired in 2000 as, as an assistant chief of department in New York City. And he mentored me all through my career and all the different stops I've made along. And we're still friends. He's going to be 79 this year. We're still friends. We still see each other and have breakfast now and then. So we get into the fire service and we, and we ask ourselves, what did we really sign up for? Okay. I picked up this quote. It's got to be 10 years ago in, in, a, in Fire Engineering Magazine. This firefighter, line firefighter, Mike Bright called out of Albuquerque. He said, the inescapable reality is that you've chosen a profession that's centered on mitigation of chaos. That's what we signed up for. As a leader in that mitigation of chaos, you have that much more responsibility to not only mitigate the chaos, but to bring your people home in one piece and make sure things go well, okay? So what we do is we select the major. I've got my little logo there. See a little hat there, a graduation mortarboard. And what it says is, this is the major leagues. How many times have you heard that? You're in the fire service, this is the major leagues. We, we talk about injury and life and death to civilians and to our own people. Okay, the lives of the average citizen are, uh, and our people depend on our knowledge, skills, abilities, and capabilities. Okay, this is not the minor leagues, it's the major leagues. And when you, when you go to college, let me just get that up there. Um, you major, you don't major in the minors, you major in the majors. And what do you mean by that, Ron? What are you talking about? Okay, so if this is the major leagues, and we are going to be leaders in the major leagues, okay, we major in the majors. Everything we read, teach, do, preach, and mean, it's got to be at that level. You don't major in the minors, you major in the majors. Remember that. Okay, so part of your self-development as well, okay, is being positive, instructive with your people. Okay, if you tell a firefighter they screwed up that whole job on a highway with, with, the, with the jaws and, and with the spreaders and all that for an accident, they come back to the fire and say, you know what, Tom? You screwed that all up. Get out of my what? Get out of my way. Get out of my life. Get out of my face. <clears throat> you didn't do anything but alienate that, that person. Be positive and constructive. Don't you remember your training? A post, B post, roll the dash, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's a training issue. Maybe it's a training issue. Okay. And, and when somebody's having a hard time, you got to show a little mutual cooperation. Sit down with them and, and hash it out a little bit. That's the sign of a good leader. That's the sign of a good leader. And to consider other people's points of view. You can't just push your will on folks and think that they're going to follow you the rest of your life. You can't do it. It's not going to work. You, you can't ram stuff down people's throat. It doesn't work. Stephen Covey, who, who is a, uh, known as a leadership guru, by the way, I recommend that book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a nice little skinny book, but it talks about these seven habits that Stephen came up with. The first habit is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Seek first to understand, listen to that person, learn the art of active listening, really truly understand what they're trying to say rather than to be understood by you, rather than to push your will on top of them. Seek first to understand and to be understood. Get Covey's book, it's good. 
Uh, on building effective relationships, I'm gonna move this picture out of the way again because it's, it's cramping my style, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> you have to create the environment by leading by example, setting the tone for ethical behavior, okay? What, what was acceptable at one time in society and in every firehouse in the United States, the kidding, the ribbing, and, and, and me, when I was younger, and you, you can call anybody anything in the firehouse. It could be racial, it could be, you name it, nobody cared. Today, people care. Okay, it bounced off your back. Everybody had a laugh. Today, it's, we live in a more sensitive society. It is what it is. We can't change that. It evolved into that. So as leaders, we have to fall into that guideline. We have to fall into that zone. So you got to set the tone for ethical behavior. <clears throat> but overall else, your personal integrity. I, I can't speak more about your personal integrity. Uh, we don't have enough time. I, hours I can go on about that. But you don't, don't forget, your integrity is your good name. It's why people trust you, why they will follow you why you will be known as a, as a good leader. Your personal integrity is key over all else, over all else. In my last command, I had an integrity issue with the town I worked for, okay? And they thought, they thought because they were my employer that they kind of owned me and I could go with the flow and, uh, and I, had different, I had a different work ethic than they thought because I stood on my principles as the fire chief and not as a political hack like the rest of them. So we parted ways. And sometimes you sacrifice your job and all that stuff. I'm working again, kids. We're, we're doing all we're okay, okay. But my I, I protected my integrity and and I, and we and we parted ways. You got to walk the talk. That's with everything. And I'm I'm listen. I'm a big safety guy. Uh, you didn't get a chance before when I was trying to share my screen. The license plate on my car says FF Safety Firefighter Safety. Okay, it's what I preach. It's what I do. Uh, so I'm big on safety. But I got how to walk the talk on the fire ground. I can't be standing there screaming at my firefighters. Put your hood on. Put your, your, your visor down. Put your gloves on, knucklehead. If I'm standing there just wearing my shirt and my pants, I got dressed at every call. Got dressed at every call. Got to set the example, set the tone. Okay. So <clears throat> I looked at, you know, when you're putting programs together, things are coming into your head. From 1970, as a young boy in Boy Scouting in Brooklyn, um, we had a, uh, a weekend some jamboree or something, a conference, a conclave. And that was on the patch. See the need, meet the challenge, which is great for Boy Scouting. See the need, meet. But what about us? That, that fits what we do every single day. And as a leader, see the need and meet the challenge. It fits. It fits. I take that right from my old Boy Scout days. Okay, so the question is, where does your compass point? Your moral compass, your ethical compass, your behavioral compass? Okay, and it's tough when, you, when you're the prankster, jokester, dirty joke firefighter in the back room, and now a week later, you're wearing a bar or two bars on your collar. Now you're the captain. Okay, so it's, it, th those are hard transitions to make. They really are hard, but you have to make a conscious decision. I'm going to get up and look in the mirror and say, here's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> so this is good advice. I keep, I keep trying to block and unblock some of my writing here with the with the, uh, what do you call it? With the, the Zoom the zoom bar, okay? And uh, <clears throat> this comes from uh, Eisenhower, who was of course a general in the army and, and the president. He said, you don't lead people by hitting them over the head. That's assault, that's not leadership. That chief I talked about, he ruled by assault. He just batted, he took out the bat every day when he came to work and slapped everybody around and thought they were gonna, they were gonna comply and, and, and they were gonna follow him. But they wouldn't follow him to the deli, trust me let alone on the fire ground. When they get to the fire ground, he said, let's do this, this, and this. They'd huddle up and say, don't do any of that. He's going to kill us, this guy, because he, no, he had no leadership credibility. <clears throat> so part of your leadership gig is being proactive, finding good solutions, brainstorming, generating ideas through the input of others. And I, I always tell people I ran a Democratic firehouse, not Democratic Republican, but Democratic in terms of, come on and let's talk about stuff. Let me bounce stuff off you. Here's what I think we should be doing. What do you think we should be doing? You know, and it worked very well for me. It, it was, it, I had a lot of success getting input from my firefighters as a chief officer. And it, it kind of worked. The proactively soliciting. I would tell them, bring stuff to the table. And when you got that big problem, okay, you break down large problems into smaller ones. Okay? It, that's all that, that's let's eat an elephant, but try to bring hungry people to the table. It's, it's the story of the two guys starving to death 
uh, they were on a safari, they got separated, they can't find them. Now they're starving to death in the jungle and they come upon an elephant. <clears throat> and Tom says to Vinny, how are we gonna, if we kill it, how the hell are we gonna eat it? And Vinny says, one bite at a time. There you go. Two guys named Tom and Vinny in the jungle, taught the picture, but there they were. So how do you eat an elephant? One, if you have that big, what looks like an insurmountable problem in the firehouse, break it down into small pieces. And that could be subcommittees, that could be captains and lieutenants taking a piece of this thing and trying to figure it out. And then we come back together in the room. You do things like, so from a long time ago, okay, we've got some wisdom. Philip II of Macedon, this is even before, before uh, I was born and before Franklin started the whole thing. Okay, he said an army of deer led by a lion is more to be feared than an army of lions led by a deer. So if you take it half and half, an army of deer led by a lion is more to be feared. Okay, so you have 50 brown-eyed, cute little deer, and there's, there's an African male lion out front, and they're walking toward you. You're in a field. And what's going through my mind is, yeah, they look kind of innocent, you know, brown-eyed deer, and they're all cute, but look at the leader. Look at the guy out front. What did he teach them? What do they now know because of his leadership and, and his ferociousness and his tenaciousness and all that stuff? So I'd be scared to death if I saw the lion with the 50 deer behind him. More of the deer than the lion, to tell you the truth. So the second half is it's more to be feared than an army of lions led by a deer. Now you got the little brown idea walking towards you and she's got 50 male lions behind her. Here's what I'm thinking. They're either gonna eat their leader for lunch, okay? Or she taught all of them to be very kind and nice and docile. What kind of leader do you wanna be? You have to ask yourself that. <clears throat> Here's Schwarzkopf's uh, a quote that I said before. Leadership is a blend of strategy and character. You have to be without one, be without strategy. That's coming from an army guy. That's amazing. Okay. The Carnegie Institute, it's a leadership institute. It's a business institute. People get hired, particularly in private industry. You know, in, in, in career civil service fire, you take a test, you get hired. But people get hired 85% on their leadership abilities. My last two commands I was interviewed for as a chief, that's absolutely true. Two hour interview, an hour and 40 minutes was on leadership. What would you do with this thing? What would you do? They gave me all scenarios, okay? And 15%, there were two chiefs in a room and they'd say, uh, when was your last second alarm? And tell me about your strategy. It was 85% leadership. That's how I got those jobs. So it's true. <clears throat> Dr. Kim Allen wrote for many years for Firehouse Magazine. And she wrote on lead, a lot of leadership stuff. And I saw her live. She came from a fire service family. Her father, her brothers, all Los Angeles firefighters. She was smart. She was brilliant. She was beautiful. She did a great job. I went to see her at a conference in New England. And uh, unfortunately, within a year or two after that, she took her own life and like no one knew, no one knew why. But uh, what she said at that seminar, and I went up to her and I introduced myself. She goes, oh, hi, Ron. She says, I've read some of your leadership stuff. So we got to chat and I said that culture trumps structure every time. I'm going to use that, but I'll give you author credit. And there it is. The underlying culture, the undercurrent in the back room, the unofficial, here's how we're going to do it, despite the bosses, is going to trump the structure of the department every time. What's the structure? Rules, regulations, SOPs, SOGs, all that stuff. So you have to understand that as a leader, that there's always an undercurrent in the back room someplace. And that's going to tend to trump your structure every time. Just be aware of that. So who are our customers? Well, as a leader, number one customer is the firefighters, the people who work for you. I always consider them as my number one customers. Here was my philosophy. Give the firefighters what they need to be successful in the street, and the end user will benefit. Who's the end user? The people who pay taxes, people coming through the town, the people uh, who work in town and then go home at night. If the firefighters are everything they need to be successful, then everybody's successful. What are, so what do they need? They need protective clothing, they need training, they need apparatus, they need tools, all of the things that we know that we, that we need. My job was to get it for them. Some of the politicians I worked for got that, some of them didn't get it. The last batch didn't get it, okay? Your department, your bosses, these are all your customers when you're a leader. The local government, all the other agencies, the taxpayers, and then the last question that's partially blocked on the screen is, are you staying current with the demographics in your jurisdiction? <clears throat> people are moving all over the place, especially now with COVID. People fled the big cities, all that stuff out of New York City. 300,000 people moved out of New York City during COVID and went to the suburbs, okay? And, and they're going to go back. They, they, they want to go back to the city, but they fled. 
Are you staying current with the demographics? Uh, different ethnic groups moving in. You need to know that because they behave, people behave differently when it's a fire emergency. <clears throat> people behave differently. And, and depending on where they're from, they might stay in the apartment. They might go to another room and stay there. Some people protect their, their domicile. Some folks just sit and pray, you know, and, and there's a whole bunch. So you got to stay current with your demographics. I had a good friend who's an assistant chief now in New York City. When he was a lieutenant, he worked in a very religious Jewish area, and he's an Italian guy. He went to the library. He read up on the on he read on, on books on on the different sects and the different groups of people, and he was able to connect with them. And when he went out and did inspections and public education, <clears throat> he connected with those folks, and they come to the firehouse and visit. Or if they got a violation from the fire inspection bureau, they go there and ask them for help and all that stuff. So that's really staying current and, and with the demographic. And he did that 30 years ago, Mike. He was ahead of his time. He's a boss, big boss now in the city. So we want you to think and act strategically. Okay, remember, we always know who you are first. Always know who you are, what position you're in, what you do, what your, what your uh, uh, integrity looks like, and all that stuff. And you can check that every day when you look in that mirror when you put your tie on, okay? You got to know your department, your people, understand your impact as a leader. What you say could be at the lunch table. Be careful what you say at the lunch table. Okay, I've been known. I've been known to, to have a uh, a fairly quick witted mind with one liners and comebacks. As you go up there, you got to be very careful what you say because it's it could be taken the wrong way, and you don't want to get in that position. Okay, and when you're making decisions, administrative decisions, consider all the variables. If we go ahead and do this as a department, what could possibly happen? What who could say? What are they going to say about? you know, uh, why we're doing that, whatever that happens to be. And as a leader, be consistent with your thinking and your actions. Whether it's a disciplinary action, you have two firefighters that get disciplined, One's, one was a good close friend of yours, the other one not so much. You can't play favorites, you can't say, all right, you got two days off and you got a half hour off and that, you must be consistent. Inconsistency ruins fire departments. And I know there's a bunch of you out there going like this right now, you're shaking your head, yes. Inconsistency ruins departments and tears them apart. As a leader, be consistent. When you set your personal standard, my good friend Pete Lamb from uh, Attleboro, Massachusetts said, what you allow to happen without your intervention becomes your standard. If you allow things to happen in the fire station, in the firehouse, or on the fire ground, without intervening, without changing the behaviors, that becomes your standard. You own it, period. Okay, so I, I think that's, that's good wisdom from there. And now we talk about tied into that is reputation management. I want you to see this entire T-shirt logo. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I think my buddy Tracy Gray, who was one of the great coordinators of all time, putting the conferences together for you folks. Um, this was at your conference a couple of years ago, Tracy. This was the T-shirt guy set up in the lobby of a hotel in Missouri, and I snapped that picture because that T-shirt went right through me, through the front and right out the back. Because if one of my firefighters walked in the firehouse wearing that shirt, it would, it, that would be the end of his day or her day. Okay. So as a leader, are you prepared to correct that? Okay. On duty or off duty? Now, off duty, that, that gets a little bit hard. But I would tell that, that firefighter, get rid of that T-shirt. I don't want to see it on you here, definitely. Okay. And if you're going to wear it off duty, wear it in another state and don't tell them where you're from. But don't wear it at all because that's a disgrace to the fire service. That hurts every one of us. If one person is wearing that T-shirt in the center of the country, let's just say Kansas City, Missouri, that's about the middle of the country, I guess. I don't know. Okay, Every fighter fighter in the United States, that's a black mark right on your cheek. It is. It is because we spend a lot of time telling the people, trust us, we'll come, we'll help. That's not it. You need to be prepared to address that. Okay, because we got the public trust. Okay, and as a leader, we want you to maintain the public trust. We're one of the very few services that's invited into people's houses all the time, any time of the day and night, under any condition. Parents holding doors, pointing us to their children's room on a medical call. Valuables are out on the table. Jewelry is out. Dad's wallet is out. They don't hide. We walk in. They're not putting things away. We've got that public trust. Okay. Uh, and for... for for two, three, two male, two male firefighter EMTs going into a 19 year old's bedroom and she's scantily clad, but she's got 104 fever and dad's holding the door. Or two female paramedics show up and, you, and your 17 year old son is laying there in his underwear because he's sick. Dad's holding the door. 
If we lose the public trust, we've lost it all. As a leader, you need to maintain that public trust. I heard uh, when I lived and worked as a chief in New Jersey, in, uh, I worked out of town. The town I, I worked in, I lived in, sorry, had a combination department. So I volunteered as, and, and all the career guys knew that I was a career chief outside and we got along great and, and we did some good things together. <clears throat> but I once heard two of them, when they came back from a medical call and it, it was a car accident with two young girls, 18, 19, and, and they, they, were, they were busted up. So they talked about their injuries and they talked about their bodies at the same time. And I said, time out. I'm not your chief. I'm not your boss, but I don't want to hear this. This is not what I want to hear. Okay. This, this is not why you're here. You forgot why you raised your right hand a long time ago. So we had that, that discussion and then uh, they apologized, I guess. Uh, so that guy in the middle, that's John Glenn, by the way, it's a picture of John Glenn, the astronaut, the making of a brave man. So we're thinking and acting strategically, training is part of that. Training your staff, training the troops and taking risk. The prudent, prudent risk takers. Well, you're looking at Columbus, you're looking at John Glenn. They said to John Glenn, we're going to strap you into this thing called a rocket and we're going to send you into space. We've never done it before. And by the way, this is a low bid federal machine. You okay with that? He said, yeah. They strapped him in and sent him into space. Holy cow. Okay. Benjamin Franklin, there's our guy, first fire chief in the United States, <clears throat> put the, the first organized fire company together in 1736 in Philadelphia, the Union Fire Company. He took a chance. But the thing about Franklin also, he wrote papers on fire prevention before he even did that. He was a big into fire prevention. So, this, you know, if you think about who the prudent risk takers are, and, and there's, you can think of hundreds of them, you know, are we better for their actions? Of course. So we, we want we want to be risk takers ourselves and not necessarily fire ground risk because we talk a lot about safety, which is good. But programmatic risk, leadership risk and that kind of thing. OK, so we talked about I mentioned the glass ceiling before. OK, so have, have you seen the glass ceiling is the question that's up now. I keep pushing myself around here. <clears throat> have you seen the glass ceiling? Sometimes you can look up and see the bosses, but you can't get to them. I know some of you is sh shaking your heads now. You can remember that you can't manage up. You can only manage down. You cannot manage up. You can see the bosses through the glass ceiling. They can't hear you. They can't see you. It's a one-way glass, like they have in a police station when they question somebody. <clears throat> so there you are, uh, you, without, without the, the leadership. So you can only influence at your level down. You can only manage down. You cannot manage up. Remember that. That should take some of your frustration up. Why won't the chief talk to me? Why can't I get through to the deputy? You can only manage down. I had, we, we do a new, we did it when I was in Connecticut. We did a new officers course once a year. So that she knew captains and lieutenants. And we say, uh, we, we give them six days of leadership, personnel stuff, the stuff they don't teach you in fire officer one, two, three, and four. This is the real deal stuff. And five officers, brand new officers, came to me at the end of the day and said, Chief, you spent a few minutes with us after class? Yeah, sure. We sat down and I, I, we know where they're all from. Connecticut's a small state. The chiefs all belong to the organization. But we promised them in the beginning of the week, we will not go back and tell your bosses anything you say. What you say has stays here. And they said, we can't get to the chief or the deputy. They, won't they don't talk to us. We, we get nothing from, from them up on the third floor. And if we do go up there, there's a lot of yelling and screaming. And I guess these guys are under some sort of pressure, these two guys. So I told them, and they won't, they won't let us train. That was the thing that went through me. They won't let us train. They won't let us use the gym. Well, physical and mental fitness is key to this, this profession of us. Whether you're a volunteer, it's a profession too, by the way. And, and uh, training. I mean, that's training and fitness is, is two key elements to, to, to the safety program. So I said, you need to train no matter what, because at 3 o'clock in the morning when those two guys are home sleeping, you're crawling down the hallway with fire blowing over your head. You need to train. When you go out on runs, train on the runs. Then they're looking at me. I said, you go to a commercial strip mall or a tax pay, whatever you call it. I said, throw a ladder to the roof, stretch a line, hook up to the fire department connection. Hey, you come back. Hey, we smelled smoke we were, while we were preparing to, to, for the fight. You can do little mini drills. You can get your training in on calls. Okay? And, and you're doing your job. You can't get yelled at for that. As far as the gym goes, you know, sign up for an outside gym, get, get in shape, stay in shape because uh, you got to be in shape. Okay. So remember, you do what you can within your level of influence. Okay. So elephants and piranhas. So this learned helplessness thing, <clears throat> when your people come to you to talk about anything, 
Okay, and I had 400 hats in my office, psychiatrist, banker, divorce lawyer, you name it. Um, basically, if you, and, and, and then just general stuff, I say bring good ideas to the table so we can you know, improve the operation, training, whatever. If you keep saying, no, no, that's stupid, go away, I don't wanna hear it, that's nuts, then they stop coming. So you te you're teaching your people how to be helpless. That's called learn helplessness. They do that with elephants. When they're baby elephants, they put a chain around their foot and they chain them to, to the floor or to a wall with about 15 feet of chain. And they know for about two years, they can't go any further than 15 feet when they got the chain on their foot. So that's why you see full grown elephants in the circus have the ankle bracelet on. That's the reminder that they can't go more than 15 feet by themselves without the handle. That's learned helplessness. They learned how to be helpless. They learned they can't walk away. Sometimes one of them gets a little crazy and they run down the middle of the street, but that's rare. The piranha experiment is that they put piranha in a, in a 300 gallon or 400 gallon fish tank and they put this, another fish that they like to eat on the other side and put a glass baffle in between. So for two days, the piranha were heading for the other fish and kept banging their heads on the baffle. The third morning, when the scientists came in, both sets of fish were swimming to the middle and turning around. They stopped hitting the wall. They stopped hitting the head on the wall. And then he pulled out the glass baffle and they continued to swim the same way. So he taught the piranha how to be helpless. They knew they couldn't get through the middle of the tank. So they said, okay, we're not gonna go through the middle of the tank to go get those fish. He taught them how to be helpless. If you do that with your people, you're gonna destroy yourself. Be an open and effective communicator. Be honest, be a good listener. Sometimes you want to repeat what you thought you heard. Make sure you're understood and watch out for micro inequities. What? What's a micro inequity? Well, micro inequity is uh, these little things like when someone's talking to you and you roll your eyes or you, you, you look down at your watch. Those are little tiny inequities that you do to people that are very noticeable. I got busted just before I left the job. I was talking to a captain and he was pouring his heart out. The guy was getting divorced. And I just... He was sitting opposite me at my desk and I looked up over his head. I had a clock on the wall and I had a meeting in town hall at three. And I just did a time check and he caught me. He said, you gotta be somewhere chief. I said, yeah, I do actually. He said, we're having a serious time. He was hurt, he was hurt. And I said, all right, relax. I said, I need to be with the mayor at three o'clock. It's, it's 10 to three, I needed to check the time, go ahead. And we finished and that was that. So people, you know, people pay attention to, to what you're doing when you're in a leadership. So on the battleground, <clears throat> okay, my research says that you have to have competence by having expertise. Character is honesty and integrity. Caring is for the welfare of the team, okay? And having those core values of service, courage, duty, integrity, honor, cohesion, and trust. That's before you get to the fire. That's before you get there. You gotta develop all that with the people that you are leading. So when you get to the battleground, they're gonna follow you and, and do it what, uh, what you want them to do. And, it, and those, a lot of those principles, this is from ancient Greece, ethos, pathos, and logos. This goes back a long ways. Trust, competence, commitment to mission, communication, vision, and principles. This goes back to ancient Greece. This is nothing brand new. So we're talking about influencing people in harm's way. The morale must be embedded in the organizational culture. <clears throat> My best example of that is years ago when Cal Ripken played for the Baltimore Orioles, um, they were, the most, they were the worst team in the league. He was out there setting all kinds of records, playing you know, two million games in a row, never missed a day. And he was a big hero, but they stunk. Why? Because they were dysfunctional off the field. When they traveled, he stayed in a different hotel and all that kind of stuff. They were dysfunctional off the field. It made him dysfunctional on the field. I've been telling firefighters like that for years. If you're dysfunctional in the firehouse, you'll be dysfunctional on the fireground. Someone's going to get hurt or killed. <clears throat> okay, so that morale must be embedded. And leaders have a direct impact in building morale before, during, and after being in a hostile environment. Before, during, and after. And you have to demonstrate effective moral building through actions, through your actions. One of the things that always worked for me for that is taking a personal interest in my people. You know, hey, Mike, I heard your kid fell off his bike and broke his leg. How's he doing? I heard your wife. I had a guy... His 44-year-old wife had a heart attack. They were leaving for Disney, and she, she dropped in the driveway. And when, I, when he came back to work, I'd ask him periodically, hey, how's your missus doing? People remember that. Drop a card in the mail. People remember that. You got to gain influence prior to being in a dangerous situation. That's how you're going to develop your people and, and be the leader you can be. So 
Looking at a case history, the station nightclub fire in West Warwick, Rhode Island, occurred in February of 2003. They had 100 civilian fatalities. <clears throat> and, and, and if you want to read a book on that, by the way, get a book called Killer Show. Killer Show. All right. That's the phrase that the band leader told all his friends and colleagues. You got to come to Warwick, Rhode Island. It's going to be a killer show. You're going to love it. It turns out it was a killer show. 100 people got killed. Uh, so there was a study done by the Southford Wooten and James of fire ground operations regarding leadership competencies the night of the fire. So here's what they found. The main competencies on leadership that they were good at transitioning operations from rescue to recovery and things like that. Organizational agility, what we do on the fire ground all the time. Change of positions, getting things done. Decision making under pressure, what we do. Stress management practices by having, uh, 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 sorry, <clears throat> by having like uh, information teams. I, I, got, I got a blank. It's it, the, the peer, peer assistance, I'm thinking SIDS teams, if, I, if I'm thinking right, there's a there's a word in there, I'm just having a blank. Okay, acting with integrity. You got, there were bodies everywhere, but the firefighters maintain that integrity, they maintain that respect, uh, and then, uh, and feedback and making improvements, having, doing that AAR, that after action review. So this is what they found. They also did a study called the Green and Blue Perspective. It was the Army and the LAPD, okay? So here's what they came up with at the end for, for the bosses and the leaders. Get the big things right, always lead by example, seek personal balance to keep yourself in check, and periodically review your, your philosophy with your subordinates. <clears throat> I did that on an annual basis with my shifts. I'd sit down and say, you know, the first, the first time I met them, we set up a, you know, what do you need from me? And here's what I expect from you. And then once a year, we'd go over that and see how we're doing like a report card. Okay. Um, they said, develop the ability and tacit knowledge to identify when and where you are needed as a leader. L look at that. Develop the ability and knowledge to identify when and where you are needed. So you don't have to be in everything all the time, but you be, should be in certain places most of the time. You got to figure that out. <clears throat> like they don't need me over there now. <clears throat> certain calls when I go, I say to the guys, let me do what I do best. Let me get out of the way. Step back a couple of feet, let them do their thing. Okay. Uh, attend all elements of an extreme event. Okay. Uh, wh whether at training or in real time, if it's big, if it's extreme, as a leader, you need to be there. They said train the whole person, body and mind. The whole person and train through an event, not just to the event. Good advice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as a leader, demonstrate righteous anger judiciously. If you run around screaming all the time, no one's going to hear you anymore. But if you're a level headed person, man or woman, and you, and you kind of have your, your thing going, and then you say, hey, wait a minute, you just raise yourself a little bit, they're going to take notice of that. And you say, well, boy, we never heard that from the boss. Well, we must have did something really stupid to get that rise out of her or whatever, okay? Uh, conduct training in teams, by teams. I think we do that well. And then seek and continuous improvement, okay? Remember, followers are needed, but leaders are necessary. Leaders are necessary, okay? But great leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. Remember that, too. Great leaders create more leaders. I am proud to stand anywhere and tell you in three commands, we moved my assistant chief up to the chief's job when I left. I worked on them. That was my job. My job was the succession plan for those people. I'm proud to say that. Uh, this uh, Arnold Glasgow, he said, a good leader takes more than his share of the blame and a little less than his share of the credit. That worked for me too. That, that was successful with my boss. Hey, wait, that, that was a great idea. When did you guys start doing it? Hey, the, the deputy came in my office and the captain walked in and said, you know, you steal people like steal people's ideas like that. Number one, they'll stop coming to you, and they're not giving you any more of their good ideas. And number two, it, it, that's theft. It's illegal. It's not nice. Don't steal people's ideas. <clears throat> so here's what a senior firefighter said to me about 180 years ago. He said, "Whatever you do, and wherever you do it, in this fire service of ours, leave it a little bit better than you found it." Okay. So what do you want? What do you? you you're going to leave a legacy, a concept, an idea a program, something you developed, okay? What do you want it to say about you at your retirement party or your funeral? If you want it to say nice things, then you gotta be doing good and nice things so it comes out the way you wanna hear it. So what do you see in the mirror? Every day, you ask yourself, is this my day to step up and fill a gap? Is this my day to make a difference? Is this the day I do the right things for the right reasons? 
because <clears throat> I will tell you, the mirror doesn't lie. Okay, look what happened to me. I told you my medical story. You can't trick the mirror or your department. You can't trick the mirror or your government, your taxpayers, your customers. What you see is who you are. On that note, thank you very much. Be well, stay well, and be safe. Chief Ron Canham is signing off. Have a great conference, Missouri. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Chief, for those uh, inspiring words. My pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, great stories. I, I appreciate what you were saying. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to throw my T-shirt away now, that, uh, since <laughs> you didn't like it. <laughs> so, again, anybody, if you want to take Ron's class, there's still time to uh, register. Go to mufrti.org. Uh, click on the Winter Fire School button. Chief uh, Frank Viscuzzo said you, you were drink, uh, dropping some great uh, bombs on there with uh, knowledge. Uh, we had a few people that uh, would like to have an input, but they're afraid they'll get in trouble because uh, they're not allowed to speak on social media. <laughs> I get it. So, uh, get it. But th that's about all the comments we had from, uh, from this. So uh, I, as always, you did a great job. Uh, that's why we enjoy having you come back every year. Uh, Thank you, Tracy. Because you do a good job. <clears throat> For the folks on social media, uh, this, this screen is still up. Uh, you have my email address. If you want to drop me a note, I'd be glad to chat with you a little bit. And uh, if you had a, a question or a comment, uh, be glad to hear from the folks in Missouri. You, you always uh, are the perfect hosts uh, when I make my way out there. So it was a pleasure to be here today with everybody. And, and thank you, Tracy, for the, for the outstanding job you do coordinating all of this, uh, these schools and, and giving the Missouri firefighters an opportunity to learn. Great. I, thank you for the kind words, sir. And uh, looking forward to sitting in your class tomorrow. I'm looking forward to being there. All right. Thanks again.